Welcome to the Liberty Dad Podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is Responding to Democratic Socialists. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm taking a concept of a dad that can speak on many different topics and applying it to liberty. But speaking is not enough. It's important to be informed and speak in a manner that invites people to seek out your opinion in the future. I recently came across an article from Ben Burgess in Jacobin Magazine titled How to Debate Libertarians on Taxes and Destroy Them. I was naturally intrigued. Could this be the article that puts a stop to us libertarians telling the world that taxation is theft? This article is two years old, but I think a response today is just as relevant as if I had made it then. And it is tax day after all. If you're not familiar with Jacobin, it's a democratic socialist magazine. If I had to summarize this article, I would say this. Libertarians have an absurdly immoral view of our liberty. Ours is better and taxes even freed the slaves. To some, that may sound a bit unfair of a summary. I've posted a link in the show notes and feel free to read it yourself and decide. I could walk through and take on the article in a point-by-point effort, but I instead felt that it would be better to accomplish the same result by tackling just a handful of the points that are in the article. The article begins by saying this, and let me go ahead and put this up on the screen so that you can see it. The article begins by saying the slogans... Hold on, let me put this right up on the screen here. The slogans of the French Revolution were liberty, equality, and fraternity. Most libertarians concede that the need for a stripped-down state that enforces a contract and provides for a national defense, that is morally acceptable. But they see redistributive taxation as an unacceptable violation of liberty in the name of those other two values. Even America's miserly patchwork of means-tested social programs is too much for them since it's paid for with other people's money. First, there are pretty much two types of libertarians, those who believe in some level of government, which we refer to as the state, and those who don't believe in any. The differences are beyond the scope of this episode, but neither type operates on the three slogans this article leads in with, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Equality and fraternity are words you're unlikely to find libertarians using. Liberty, however, is a common placeholder when we describe a more fundamental concept, that of self-ownership. This plays a role in the next line where Burgess says this, Libertarians deny that anyone has positive rights like the right to health care or education. Instead, they argue that liberty is best understood in terms of negative rights against interference by others. Since some of my listeners are not necessarily libertarian or maybe newer libertarians, I want to play a clip that does a great job of describing the differences between positive and negative rights. Now, this clip is about four minutes long, so please bear with me, but I think it's worth the time. One reason there's a lot of confusion about rights from both liberals and conservatives is that there are different sorts of rights. Besides the distinction between legal and moral rights, we also need to distinguish the different sorts of claims the assertion of a right makes. Philosophers generally use the expressions negative rights and positive rights to express these distinctions. Now, there's nothing evaluative about these terms. It's not negative in a bad way. These are precise terms that philosophers use to make an important distinction. So let's see if we can explore it. Consider this claim. I have the right to go to the store and get a lottery ticket. Let's begin with what this doesn't mean. First of all, it doesn't mean I have an obligation to buy a lottery ticket. It's up to me. No one should be forcing me to buy one. But also, no one should be forcing me not to buy one. Second of all, it doesn't mean that the store clerk has any obligation to give me one. I'll have to pay for it, which is shorthand for making a trade. This works whether we're talking about lottery tickets, milk, potato chips, coffee, beef. My right to get these things is not an obligation to get them, and neither is it a warrant to be given them. My right to get these things means that no one ought to stop me from making trades through which I can acquire them. That's a little different from, say, when you get arrested and are informed that you have the right to an attorney. You know how they say it from TV. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. The store is under no obligation to provide me with a stake if I can't afford one. But the folks who arrested me 
are obliged to provide me with an attorney if I cannot afford one. So these are different kinds of rights. One way to get clear on this distinction is to think about the relationship between rights and duties. If Smith has a right, then Jones has a duty. Understanding what different kinds of duties Jones might have is one way to understand what kinds of rights Smith might have. We'll call negative rights the kind of rights which impose on others a negative duty, a duty not to do anything, a duty of non-interference. If I have a right of this sort, all you have to do to respect that right is refrain from blocking me. Negative rights are sometimes called liberties. Now we'll call positive rights the kind of rights which impose on others a positive duty, a duty to provide or act in a certain way. If I have a right of this sort, you respect it by complying. Positive rights are also sometimes called entitlements. So my right to a lottery ticket or a stake is a negative right. No one can properly interfere with my efforts to acquire these through trade. Freedom of speech is another example of a negative right. I cannot be arrested for speaking out. The right of criminal suspects to an attorney is a positive right. One will be provided. One interesting feature of negative rights is that they don't conflict, and we can all respect everyone else's liberties all the time. We simply have to refrain from using force to make people do our bidding. Positive rights can conflict, and in a couple of ways. One way they can conflict is scarcity. If there are 10 public defenders and 100 people get arrested, they can't all have their right to an attorney satisfied equally. This sort of conflict can sometimes help us understand which claims are legitimate. Your property rights give you exclusive use of a resource, so others can't claim a right to vacation in your yard, at least not without your permission. The other source of conflict raises a more troubling issue. Since positive rights create duties on others to act or provide, doesn't that represent a violation of their negative rights, their liberty? It depends. Some positive rights are created by a contractual relationship. Since I'm a member of AAA, I have a positive right to towing services if my car breaks down. Non-members have a negative right to seek towing services, but I'm actually entitled to receive them. That doesn't violate anyone's negative rights, though, because the relationship is entirely consensual and defined by a contract. If I claimed I had a positive right to a stake, someone would have an obligation to give me one, not as a trade, but as a non-consensual service. That would violate their liberty, making them involuntarily subservient to me. This suggests that if we're free and equal by nature, any positive rights would have to be grounded in consensual arrangements. Unfortunately, for a lot of so-called positive rights, this just isn't the case. Great. Now that we have a reasonable understanding, let's look back at what Burgess said. Libertarians deny that anyone has positive rights, like the right to health care or education. But this isn't true. As Professor Scoble points out, contractual agreements can provide positive rights. A parent who signs their child up for private school and pays the required fee now has the right to send their child to that school. We can reword this to say it like so. Because of a mutually agreed upon contract, the school has an obligation to teach one person's child who then also has an obligation to give them a certain amount of money. <clears throat> Do you see the problem already? I'm only a couple of paragraphs in, and there are problems with how the libertarian position is being understood. We'll explore this in just a moment, but let's continue. The libertarian position is best understood as starting with self-ownership where individual rights impose no obligation other than that of non-interference of others. Burgess continues saying this. Let's scroll down to it here. The claim that liberty is non-interference has been expressed by libertarian thinkers like Murray Rothbard as the non-aggression principle, or the NAP. Rothbard's formulation of the NAP was that, quote, no man may threaten or commit violence against another man's person or property, end quote. He used this to condemn taxation, which he described as, quote, the use of violence to obtain its revenue, end quote. And he's talking about the state there. Burgess then continues by saying this, a Rothbardian might say that violence is being committed against the owner of the property if it's taken away from them or destroyed without their permission. But this too is a little more than odd, uh, more than a little odd. If a teenager sticks a candy bar in his pocket at a grocery store, has he really committed violence against the owner? He certainly hasn't threatened the owner with violence. Perhaps libertarians don't need to die on this semantic hill. The nap can be rephrased as, quote, no one may threaten 
or commit violence against a person or take away their property, except in the course of conflict initiated by the other party. That's fine, but the key phrase is their property. Now, I'm going to give Burgess a little credit for attempting to clarify what he saw as a narrow definition of the NAP. However, when he adds the words, or take away their property, he does limit property to only being stolen and not destroyed. Regular audience members may recall what I said about self-ownership back in episode 42. Here's what I said. Self-ownership is simply the unequivocal, unequivocal right of ownership of your own body. And because you own your body, you own that which it produces. If I square off a plot in my yard, prepare it, plant vegetables, and water them every day, the vegetables that are produced are mine to do with as I please. I can sell them for any price another is willing to pay. I may give them away, eat them all to myself, or toss them in my compost pile for whatever purpose I have. And then in episode 43, here's what I said about the non-aggression principle. When I discussed self-ownership, I did not provide a definition because I believe the term is rather self-defining. But in this case, it's worth taking a moment to define the non-aggression principle so that we are operating on the same understanding. Here is a formal definition. The principle of non-aggression is a concept that asserts aggression is inherently illegitimate. Aggression is defined as the initiation of physical force against persons or property, the threat of such or fraud upon persons or their property. The non-aggression principle does not preclude the use of self-defense up to and including lethal. With that definition, we can now better answer Burgess's hypothetical about a teenager who steals a candy bar from a store owner. Has the teen violated the nap? Yes, they have. The candy bar represents labor from the store owner's body, and under the libertarian view of self-ownership, the store owner uh, owns any object or any item that results from the use of his or her body. In this case, the store owner has worked to accumulate money and then uses that to purchase candy bars for sale. And since we're talking about a teenager in a store, Recall a moment ago when Professor Scoble described the contractual agreement between him and AAA. That contractual agreement entitles him to services while non-members are not entitled to services. Similarly, the teen has no such contract that allows him to go in and simply grab a candy bar and take it from the store owner. Therefore, even though there may not be the outward violence, that is to say a gun or a threat of physical violence, the teen's actions impose a duty on the store owner to provide the candy bar without any agreed upon contract. Burgess ends that last paragraph saying this, that's fine, but the key phrase is their property. This is where we start to get into some of the differences between Burgess's position and the libertarian position. A bit further in the article, it says this, theft can, precisely, can be precisely defined as taking something you have no right to take. Therefore, theft as a legal category is taking something that you have no legal right to take, and theft as a moral category is taking something you have no moral right to take. If the Wall Street traders have a moral right to the money, the socialist government is committing theft. If the college students have a moral right to it, the socialist government is acting justly on their behalf, like the police recovering a stolen car. Who's right about this gets down to what philosophers call a theory of entitlement. In other words, a theory of who has a moral right to what. If you believe that everyone has a moral right to whatever they end up with as a result of market transactions, taxation is theft. But why should you believe that? Now, here's what I find interesting. Burgess doesn't explain why one should or should not believe this. And for the record, if I'm nitpicking, which libertarians are known to do, I'd argue that this phrasing, this a moral right to whatever they end up with as a result of market transaction, really dilutes the importance of consenting agreements. Results are not whatever they end up, but rather what is agreed upon. I digress. The very next paragraph tells us quite a bit and really distinguishes Burgess's foundation from ours. Here's what it says. If you have the far more plausible belief that considerations like fairness and the importance of securing goods like health care and education enter into the question of who has a moral right to what, this wouldn't justify taxation for purposes like arming Saudi Arabia for its monstrous war in Yemen. 
but it would certainly justify it for purposes like abolishing tuition at public universities. First, yes, the war in Yemen is absolutely monstrous. On that, we agree. But notice that phrases that Burgess, is, Burgess uses like far more plausible and fairness and the importance of. The key differences between what Burgess is arguing and the libertarian position is that the libertarian position starts and ends with each individual. An individual owns their body, their self, and may not initiate aggression against someone else. The only obligation from others is not interference. What is fair and important is defined by each individual rather than a collective body. Burgess fails to explain why it's more plausible to hold the belief that fairness and importance should drive what constitutes a moral right. I presume that this is more well understood in the democratic socialist community. The libertarian position, as I stated earlier, though, starts with the idea that each person owns their own self, which includes their labor, and, what owner, and that ownership provides them the moral right to things that they produce. It also provides them the right to defend their self and property, again, things produced from their labor, against those who impose some obligation through aggression. I want to start wrapping things up towards the end of the article. Let's go ahead and scroll down to that end of the article there. Towards the end of the article, this is what Burgess says. Everything that's been said so far has relied on granting, for the sake of argument, the libertarian's premise that liberty is non-interference. But the moral case for redistribution is even stronger when we switch to the more plausible view that the kind of freedom that matters most is the freedom from arbitrary domination. Again, this incorrectly describes the libertarian position. It is not arbitrary domination when, in, when individual A and individual B make some contractual agreement that exchanges service, property, or money. Each person is making a decision they believe leaves them better off having made the transaction than if they had otherwise chosen not. To call it an arbitrary domination means a third party, be it an individual or group, must decide whether either of the two or both are better off. Burgess then goes on to say this. Let's scroll down here a little bit. And I don't have it highlighted, so I apologize. But he says, this is what's sometimes called the Republican theory of liberty. This, the theory that Karl Marx was working with when he expressed this hope that the, dis, that the quote, despotic system of the subordination of labor to capital can be superseded by the Republican and beneficent system of the association of free and equal producers, end quote. If Amazon was taken away from Jeff Bezos and reorganized as a worker cooperative, then everyone who worked in those warehouses would have a greatly enhanced level of control over their own lives. Here's the problem. Burgess's selected quote from Marx conflicts with the stated goal. I want you to listen to it again very carefully. The quote, despotic system of the subordination of labor to capital can be superseded by the Republican and beneficent system of the association of free and equal producers, end quote. But then he goes on to say that taking from Amazon and reorganizing would enhance the level of control over the lives of current employees. The libertarian position starts and ends with the individual and makes no moral judgment along the way, provided that the NAP is not violated. Furthermore, while the libertarian position is firmly against taking Amazon from Jeff Bezos, it does not preclude a group of people organizing and creating their own worker cooperative. Nor does it prevent Bezos, if he so chose, to reorganize Amazon into one either. Now I want you to imagine the audacity of calling a system that permits worker cooperatives to simultaneously exist with a, any variety of other forms of organization arbitrary domination, those are Burgess's words, versus a system that limits the type of organizations that may exist. In other words, in the libertarian model, many more types of organizations might exist based on the choices that people make. Under this particular model that Burgess is describing, this worker cooperative, only one might. Burgess ends by saying this, <clears throat> by saying that it's important to be able to show that the libertarian arguments don't work even on their own terms. However, he fell far short in doing so. More than once, he failed to even accurately describe the libertarian position. 
the title How to Debate Libertarians on Taxes and Destroy Them carries more fiction than any Marvel film that you'll see. Oh, and one last thing. Burgess concludes by claiming that federal income taxes funded the war that freed 3.9 million slaves. Very good thing, right? Well, good students of history will point out that the Revenue Act of 1861 was indeed to fund the war, as was its successor in 1862, and then again the successor in 1864. These successors levied taxes, uh, each one before the other, and failed to fund the war adequately. With enough taxes, yes, governments can do a great many things that people might agree are good. However, since Burgess argues morality as an important component, he might do well to explain how moral is it for a government to take money from people on the promise of very specific results and then require further taking as a result of its own failure to deliver? This is a problem from the 1800s and one that continues today. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Connect with me at Liberty Dad on Facebook, Liberty Dad Pod on Twitter, or send me hate or love mail to LibertyDadPodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.